This is the New York State Association of Counties. Uh, it is a bipartisan municipal association representing all of the counties of New York, and we're here for the 2019 legislative session or legislative conference. Well, this conference welcomes county officials from all across the state, from Western New York Capital District, uh, the Southern Tier, North Country, Long Island, Hudson Valley, all over New York State, county executives, county legislators, county and town officials convene at this conference. It's really a unique uh, opportunity uh, to interact with uh, municipal officials in a bipartisan manner. There is no other forum that allows this to happen uh, with local government officials in a bipartisan manner, sitting down, training each other on best practices, what's working in their communities, and helping each other uh, provide the best services at, at the lowest tax uh, burden you know, they can have for the public. There are about 700 of us here uh, gathered to uh, evaluate uh, some of the changes that are coming from the governor's proposed executive budget and learn about uh, the policy changes and how they might affect taxpayers back home. Everything that the state is doing uh, has an impact on county governance because we have so many places where we interact uh, and programs that we deliver on their behalf. Just coming here and meeting with people and collaborating with them, hearing what they're doing in their county, um, we all share some of the same issues uh, throughout the state and just hearing from experienced people who have dealt with those issues and have worked on them for years, uh, just trying to collaborate and get different ideas from them. You use these conferences as an opportunity to meet with fellow county leaders from across New York State, hear what they're doing, uh, take the best practices that they're doing in their communities and bringing it back home to my county and Erie County in the Buffalo, New York area. And then, of course, use the opportunity to go over to Capitol Hill, talk to the folks at the uh, New York State Capitol, the Assembly Senate, and the Governor's Office, and let them know what matters to us and to hear back from them on the issues that they're working on in our community. I was a legislator for five years. This is my eighth year as county executive, and NYSAC, I tell all of the legislators, the new ones and the and ones that have served for a while, that this should be mandated. And I hate to say use that word, but NYSAC should be a mandate. The legislators should come and participate. It's so valuable, really, on all the challenges at this conference and then the one again in the fall, because things are shifting and changing every day, you know, the challenges that we're all facing. So um, I think it's very important that everyone participate. Uh, this has always been a great conference now and, and you know I see we have a lot of new county legislators here which is great because there's a lot you can learn um, you know two and a half days is barely enough but uh, over the years I've been coming here I've learned a tremendous amount about county government there is no other forum that provides this unique opportunity to get training for newly elected officials or folks who have been in office for many years. Again, this is a bipartisan conference here. Training is offered on all sorts of aspects of state and local budgeting, finance, public safety, policy decisions are made here concerning uh, state and local relations. And it provides an opportunity for state officials to interact with local government officials as well. We're learning about some of the aspects of uh, the, the governor's budget that will result in revenue uh, to the counties and we're hopeful that that will allow us to uh, reduce tax bills. The governor's proposing to make the property tax gap permanent. Um, it, it's a struggle for counties, it's for all municipalities and school districts to stay under the cap. Uh, a lot of years it's less than 2%, it's the lower of inflation or 2%. Um, we were a little concerned about making it permanent without uh, more mandate relief. Um, there was some mandate relief earlier in the process but it's kind of come to a halt. This governor's been pretty good about funding new expenses um, with state dollars. Raise the age as an example. There's $200 million in the budget. There's another $100 million in the budget for uh, indigent defense services. These are expansions he called for, but he's funded them. The problem is we've got to, historically, the funding doesn't last. The, the, as soon as the state budget gets in trouble, the funding falls away. Um, and that's a problem for us when you have a tax cap and we have no other option when the state revenue runs out. It's uh, frightening in some regards uh, as usual and, and coming out of Albany where I spent seven years there in the assembly, uh, I was witness to a lot of this as an assemblyman, now see it on the other side as a county executive. What we worry about is the continuation of unfunded mandates. A uh, quick example of that is early voting. None of us that I've spoken to, uh, I don't see anybody really opposed to the idea of early voting because we certainly want more turnout. However, this comes with a price tag 
just to Rensselaer County of about $237,000 with no money from the state to pay for it. This is, by the way, after our budget's out and passed and enacted. So uh, things like that are pretty concerning to us. And then just watching, uh, we're cautiously optimistic and watching what the state does daily. We're still reviewing the state budget. Um, I am very supportive of keeping the property tax cap uh, in place and making it permanent. Uh, I hope that the state looks at unfunded mandates because that uh, would certainly relieve the property tax burden for New Yorkers. Uh, no matter where you live in the state of New York, everyone is talking about the property tax burden that is directly connected to the unfunded mandate. So while we're very supportive of a permanent property tax cap, uh, we also want to make sure that the state does its part and uh, pick up the unfunded mandates and uh, tighten the reins on spending as well. The other parts of the state budget that we're looking at uh, with Raise the Age, there's a lot of uh, uh, added um, budget, budgetary impact to counties. We're looking uh, for the state again to uh, do what they said they were going to do, and that is to make counties whole with uh, funding. Um, but certainly, uh, as we look at uh, the proposals in the state budget, uh, we want to make sure that whatever is proposed that directly impacts the counties is paid for by the state of New York. Again, looking at unfund unfunded mandates, but all of the programs that the state is pushing to make sure that those are funded and that county taxpayers don't bear the brunt of the burden of uh, additional tax uh, burdens. It hurts our families, it hurts our businesses. I look at this as an opportunity to talk directly with our leaders. I know I'll be talking directly with the governor about the issues that matter to me and hear back from him on the issues that matter to him. It's a tight state budget. We know that there was a $3 billion gap to begin with. Uh, our hope is that he doesn't pass any additional costs onto the backs of counties through mandates. Uh, so far, it seems like he hasn't proposed that, so we're going to send that same message as well to the Assembly and Senate. We want to make sure that there's no further unfunded mandates in there that the counties have to deal with. Uh, I think I like the, the cap on the property tax. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, as we're watching new legislation come out of Albany every day, we just want to see what the, legaliz what the cost of legalization of marijuana is going to do uh, to each individual county. I hope they're looking at some of these proposals long term and the effects that they're going to have uh, financially long term on any of the local municipalities. Sadly, again, I think we're staring at uh, continued uh, increase of, of some unfunded mandates that need to be confronted. But there's opportunity there, right, uh, through criminal justice reforms and uh, some other steps taken. Uh, you know, we, we we could not only improve the quality of life for those we serve, but we hope that with uh, the assistance of the state legislature, we'll see a little bit of uh, relief, or at least not having to shoulder new burden uh, for some of the reforms the state government's imposing. Well, I'm really concerned about a couple of things. I think that it is going to make an impact. I'll be curious to see what legislation passes, how this is proposed, and how this really affects the budget. As we know, every action has a reaction. So some of these pieces of legislation that are in the budget and some of the budget items that are in there, I'm curious to see what the real expense is for the counties. As we know, I think the state has good intentions, but sometimes there are unintended costs to the counties. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here at NYSAC to hear from other counties and other representatives to see how they are going to approach the state budget and what they want to do with it. A lot of the changes are coming pretty quick. Uh, we're still trying to wrap our heads around you know, all the changes here in Albany County, um, but you know, we, we stand ready you know, to help our state legislature you know, representatives help implement some of these changes that we're seeing at the state level here in Albany County. We're concerned about the implementation of uh, uh, recreational uh, use marijuana and how that's going to impact our, our criminal justice system, our uh, mental health services, and our public health services back home. We're looking at what the other states are telling us, the states like Colorado and Washington who've been managing the legalization of marijuana. Uh, so we're looking at that. We're looking at the impact of law enforcement and uh, the challenges that they're going to be facing with the uh, introduction of marijuana now, you know, with folks driving or, you know, the impairment, how are you going to calculate that and the impact? It's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. My concern is that um, you will have people uh, that are going to want the unrestricted use of marijuana anywhere. And, and keep in mind that marijuana is not only smoked, it's, it's taken in, in several forms. And in fact, I'm told in states like Colorado, um, most people buy it uh, you know, in other forms besides to smoke it. So now we have to worry about uh, people that run a, a licensed establishment that serves alcohol. Uh, if, if people are allowed to, are they allowed to bring in food laced with uh, marijuana and consume it on a licensed establishment? And is it then the response 
responsibility of that license holder to ensure that that person leaves that establishment, uh, you know, uh, sober enough uh, uh, to operate their vehicle. And how can that be their responsibility when they haven't served them any alcohol? Uh, so this is these are a lot of questions that have not been answered, and uh, it's going to have a tremendous burden on our communities. And uh, I, I want some common sense and some thoughtfulness applied to this. And so far, with the way the state legislature has rushed things through so far this year, I don't see that any any common sense happening so far. We're here today uh, introducing uh, Stu Brody. Uh, Stu is an author. Uh, he's worked in government. Uh, he's worked for the association here. Uh, he's very familiar with local government officials all over New York State. He recently wrote a book, The Law of Small Things. And integrity in government is no small thing. That is a monumental uh, component, a character of an individual who serves in public office. And so we have Mr. Brody here today to share his experiences in this new book, uh, how he can help educate and train local government officials on public integrity and why it matters. Ethics is critical. In fact, in New York, we have so many examples of people breaching uh, the conventions of ethics, and we can learn things from them. But the most important lessons about ethics is that ethics begins with small things. That's the name of my book, The Law of Small Things. And the rest of that title is Creating a Habit of Integrity in a Culture of Mistrust. So you see the concept there? That it's difficult to practice integrity in a culture that really degrades integrity. So ethics can be something that you intend to do, but the fact of the matter is that there are all kinds of influences around us that actually impel us to not practice it. So the law of small things is let's start practicing with small things, like not telling white lies. But a lot of people say, but a white lie is meaningless, it's just inconsequential. I'll be ready for the big things. You can count on me. You can vote for me. I'll be ready. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story that unfolded on a mountain. Uh, let me tell you the story. So this is a true story, and it happened on Mount Everest. Okay, so about 14 years ago, it was made into a movie. For, I guess, 40 climbers passed up a distressed climber on the mountain. In other words, someone who was really in extreme condition. 40 of them passed him up. But what I mean by that is that some of them might have like given him a blanket or given him some oxygen for a few minutes, you know, or dug a little snow cave for him, all right, and or give him water or something. But no one took the responsibility to get him down to the base camp where he could be attended to medically. And he died. So Sir Edmund Hillary, does everybody know who he is? He was the first climber on Everest. At the time, before he died, he was the most famous mountaineer in the world. And he was outraged, in part because a number of those climbers who passed up the distressed climber were New Zealanders, and that's where he's from. And he said, when I was on Everest, as badly as I wanted to get up that mountain, the summit is very secondary to saving a life. Can't argue with that. But 40 people passed him up. If you had asked those 40 people, when it comes to saving a life, is there anything more important? And they would say, no, of course not. Saving a life is the most important thing. But they left it to someone else. They left it to someone else to, to do. So the point here is that when you look at things, we live in a culture, and this is a critical integrity point, we live in a culture that leaves it to other people to do things. Now think about what happened to, you know, in 2007, I was about to retire from my job as a lawyer. As you can see, I'm not retired, although maybe some of you would think that based on my comments about integrity, but, but you know, and my portfolio suffered, and maybe yours did too, why? because millions of individuals sought loans that they couldn't afford, but they left it to the banks to clean up. They left it to somebody else to clean up. And what about the investment bankers that made securities out of these terrible loans? Well, they left it to the government 
to sort out. And it kept going down the line. The insurance company, we don't have the money, but let's do it anyway. And the, and the rating agencies. Okay, so we have a culture that leaves it to somebody else. On the big things, like, like the, the, the efficacy of the government and of our financial system. Okay, and how about advertisers who leave it to us to sift through their inflated product claims? It's ridiculous to watch that, isn't it? And how about politicians? Not in this room, not county, <laughs> but politicians in Washington who leave it to us to sift through their exaggerated boasts. I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about a lot of people who, who do that. And how about motorists who leave it to others to be more cautious because they're busy texting? Or people in workplaces who leave it to others to report sexual harassment because they don't want to get involved. So we have this culture of leaving it to others. So if we're not ready for the big things, how, how do we get ready for the big things if we don't practice with the small things? So that's really, that's really the question. Now, to practice integrity, it's not easy because we have to break through certain patterns of thinking things are small, inconsequential, we'll be ready for the big things. You know, but we don't, we don't think about what constitutes a big thing. The big thing is right in front of you. <laughs> like when you walk into your county offices and you see a pile of papers and you're groaning because you're never gonna get through it and you ask yourself, is this what my job is, has come down to? Sifting through applications or paperwork or briefs or drafts, and you don't even know why you got into public service anymore. But what, you, what is going on in that small thing is a reflection of the biggest thing, which is serving a democracy, the greatest experience in democracy in the history of the world. So by training ourselves to look at what a small thing is in reflection of a big thing, well, that's, that's an exercise in integrity. Always understanding how powerful it is what we do in small ways. You know, integrity is very hard. I know people say just do it, and I made a joke about that, and I think we all laughed about just do it, like a Nike commercial. But it's really hard, because when you really think about it, avoiding embarrassment is really what integrity is for most people, just staying out of trouble. So I'm going to give you an example of that. Like Warren Buffett, who we admire. Do, do we admire Warren Buffett? I mean, he's a cultural icon, so there are some hands. So here's his definition of integrity. He said, when you contemplate an act, try to imagine that what you're doing or what you're about to do is on the front page of the newspaper the next day, read by your family, your kids, your spouse, and your friends and then decide whether you'd want to go ahead and do it. I was in elective office in local government for 20 years, four on the county legislature and 16 years as county executive. But actually, I grew up in local government. Right out of college, I began my career in information technology in local government, and so worked as an appointed official for several years before moving into elective office. I find it tremendously rewarding to work in local government because every day you get to make a difference in the lives of your neighbors, the people that live in your community, and you get to go home feeling pretty good about the job that you did. So there's no other field that is more rigorous and more challenging but more rewarding. So I would say this is the field, if you want to be an elected official, that you can make the biggest difference in your community and help the most people. First I would say run. <laughs> run for office. Uh, we need more women in all levels of government and certainly local government is no exception. Uh, the beauty of that is that you have the opportunity 
community, uh, to impact policies, to impact programs that affect the people in your community in a positive way. And I think it's important that we have women in government because then we have their view on the world. Now, that's not to say that I don't like men. I happen to be married to one, so I like men very much, but we like to have different opinions at the table so that we can formulate policy that applies to both men and women across the community and make sure that that policy is going to be the best that it can be. Well, overall, if the budget passed as is, it would probably be a positive impact um, on counties. Uh, the main reason is the uh, Internet sales tax piece um, that's included in the budget is a pretty big revenue source for counties. It's the second largest revenue source overall, and for more than half the counties, it's the number one revenue source. So that's a pretty big uh, component of the budget. There are some negatives in the budget from a financial perspective. Um, but we need to do more analysis to figure out what those are. But some of the items, including cashless bail, election reform, there's going to be local county costs for that, that there's no money in the budget for it. So we need to evaluate that. But overall, it's probably a net positive. There's a couple of things the governor does. As I said, the, the, the budget division does try to be responsible with the, with the money they have, given the people in charge and what they tell them to do. Um, so they, they try to create... Um, if things go bad, they want to create um, safe harbors where they can control spending better. So there's, this governor's had this authority in the budget for the last couple of years. I think this will be the third year. But if there's a, a reduction in Medicaid funds or any type of federal funding of more than $850 million in, in, within the time frame of the, the fiscal year, the state would, the director of the budget would be able to cut funding mainly local assistance um, across the board and then the legislature would have 90 days to approve it. We haven't hit this threshold yet on the federal side. This was a bigger scare during the Affordable Care Act and had that been repealed, the state would have lost about $3 billion in federal money. The counties would have lost um, the six or seven hundred million benefit we get now, um, which is kind of split between New York City and the counties. That all would have evaporated. Um, I don't. With the current makeup of Congress, I'm not sure the ACA is going to get repealed, but it's going through the courts now, so there's, there's, there, there's that issue there. <clears throat> the governor asked for the second provision. If revenue estimates fall by more than $500 million in the year, he's asking for authority um, to cut across the board in local assistance 3% from all programs. But he would exempt um, education, uh, Medicaid, and I think public assistance. So the 3% that's left is, I mean, as a county, Medicaid is, we pay our set amount as we're told to. Public assistance would be exempt. That would have hurt us. Um, and education, which is a lion's share of spending. But everything else you get as a county, like the state reimbursement, would be cut. Um, he asked for this last year. The legislature didn't give it to him. The real threat here is, and we just talked about it, um, They've been off on the revenue estimates by 4.6 billion over the last three, well, going on four years now, and they've changed their revenue estimates seven times in that period. So a $500 million <laughs> negative adjustment is, there's a, probably a pretty good chance that could happen again based on the recent historical trend um, of the revenue estimating. That's something you can't budget for either. It's a mid-year cut before they realize. It's usually halfway through the financial plan which is September, which is nine months into your fiscal year, it's very difficult to manage a 3% across the board and you know, dozens of programs, potentially. <clears throat> As I indicated before, there's, there's some good things in the budget. Um, we talked about this last year. The governor is on round three of offering this up in the budget. Um, we've had mixed support in the legislature. The Senate has never really supported this concept. But basically, it's with the Supreme Court decision, um, it's pretty clear states have the right to collect uh, sales tax on internet transactions um, when people sell stuff into your state. So as I said before, the governor's taking a, um, a two-pronged approach here. He's proposing legislation to make it easier for small vendors to have their sales tax collected by somebody else, which means if you sell stuff using Amazon or Etsy or eBay as your platform, 
eBay, Etsy, and Amazon will be responsible for collecting all the sales tax and remitting it directly back to the state. That requires a legislative change because you're basically saying, and this is done under retail products for brick and mortar today in New York. If you go, I always give the example of the antique mall. You go to an antique mall, there's a hundred different vendors in there, there's one cash register. The cash register is responsible for collecting sales tax for everybody. The state is viewing Amazon and these marketplace providers as the cash register, and they will be responsible for collecting sales tax. The benefit for small vendors is if they, are, if they have an agreement with Amazon to do that on their behalf, they have no responsibility to collect sales tax. They don't have to do anything with the state other than show, I've got my certification, they send it in once a year. Um, I don't know how easy that administrative process will be, but um, the intent is Amazon's driving the bus here, and some of these <coughs> online retailers let them do it. The other half is there's an administrative piece, um, and I'll go through it here. But these are just a few slides on how big digital commerce has become. It's just growing leaps and bounds. Um, it, it's really amazing um, through the, the years. And Amazon is an animal. Half of everything sold over the internet goes through Amazon. It's either their own product they sell directly, or it's that big blue blob there, the 31% of what they call the Amazon marketplace. 31% of everything sold over the internet is Amazon's marketplace. Um, and that's where sales tax collections tend not to get collected, is the third party vendors. And that's growing, the marketplace is growing faster than Amazon's own sales. Um, but Amazon doesn't mind, because they get a fee from everything sold on their marketplace. And when they start collecting sales tax, they'll charge a fee for that too, I'm sure. Um, and everybody else, the rest is the other half. Um, and so, you know, it's, and this is some of the statistics just looking at the dollar amounts and who's, I mean, eBay's the next closest and they're 12 times smaller or, or 10 times smaller. It's just amazing how big. And Amazon's growing at double digits each year. It, obviously, you can't do that forever. There's going to be a point where it levels out. But, and what do the guys sell? This is just some information, you know, this is why you're seeing locally your big box electronics retailers having a hard time, oh, they're not opening new stores and they're having a hard time staying in business um, because the competition online, the number one competitor is electronics and then it's clothing. It's affecting your department stores, your independent clothing store. They just have a hard time competing um, and that's mainly where they're competing online, especially in the third, third, mark, the third party category. The key points we make on this always on the sales tax is this is not a new tax. This tax is owed under state law. Um, and for many counties, sales tax is your number one source of revenue. It's far outstripped your ability to, uh, than property taxes. We, sell, we share a lot of sales tax. We'll, we're gonna share close to $2 billion in 2018 of sales tax with towns, cities, and villages. Cities have the right to preempt. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, we use the sales tax to help offset increases in property tax. Um, and as I said, they, the marketplace is, the, is a statutory component where you're just gonna have Amazon collect. That proposal on a full annual basis, the, the division of budget is assuming that's worth about $280 million for counties in New York City. And it's almost an even split between the counties in New York City um, as far as, you know, what share are you of the e-commerce marketplace. And the state gets a benefit too of about a quarter billion dollars from this proposal, the, the legislative side of it. If you look at the agenda at the NISAC conference, it's amazing. It's domestic policy A to Z. We are dealing with everything from the trade tariff impact on recycling and solid waste to uh, issues like gambling and what's that gonna do for county governments to the potential impact of legalizing marijuana. What will that do for the health and human services and public safety work of counties to transportation? It's just across the board. And what it shows is that county government is an incredibly complex level of government dealing with all the domestic policy issues across the spectrum. This is an association that serves all of these local government officials, that there's a place to call, there's a place to help local taxpayers advocate for their communities, and it's through this type of a forum that we can provide the best services for all of New Yorkers. 
How can people get more information about your organization? Uh, they can look us up on the website at www.nysac.org.